Well, aloha, Friday again, I mean, Wednesday again already. <laughs> Where did that week go? Um, this is Mitch Ewan, and we're with uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And we are uh, funded and sponsored by the Hawaii Energy uh, Policy Forum, of which I'm a member. And also the money comes from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, HNEI, which I am also a member. So we have a really uh, cool show for you today. We're gonna to be talking about air conditioning in a hot climate. And uh, we have these, a uh, friend of mine started this company uh, several iterations ago. And we have the president of the company today, Greg uh, Trapsaw. He's actually phoning us from Colorado, although the company's uh, based in Florida. So Greg, welcome to the show. There Thanks, you I, I love see to you. be in your beautiful environment today. Yeah, you said it was going to be minus one degree in uh, in, in Fort Shortly. Collins, Colorado. Yeah, so eat your heart out. All my classmates who live up in Canada, I love the backgrounds we have here. I always try to, you know, <laughs> taunt them with this. <laughs> so anyway, so Greg, tell us about uh, Blue Frontier AC and all your secret sauce and what you guys do. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And thanks for inviting us onto your show. It's it's my pleasure to be here. As as you said, my name's Greg Tropsa. I'm the president and I'm a co-founder of Blue Frontier. And we have some graphics we can switch to the next slide. There we go. There you go. That's me. And we'll go to the next slide. Yeah. So what you you probably know that the last five years were the hottest on record. But what you might not know is that air conditioning consumes 10% of global electricity production and is responsible for 5% of all uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. And we can switch to the next slide. And the problem is the demand for air conditioning is spiraling out of control. The number of air conditioning units on the planet is gonna double uh, by 2025 and triple by 2050. So, you know, it talks about 10 new air conditioning units are going to be installed every second for the next 30 years. Wow. And so that's creates a huge demand for energy for air conditioners. Um, so as the planet warms, we use more air conditioners, we create more greenhouse gas emissions. So we got to break that cycle. And that's what Blue Frontier does. And in fact, recently, the International Energy Agency named air conditioning as the uh, blind spot in global energy policy. Well, we're sure you need it here slide. in Hawaii, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, you do. So um, the problem for the electric utility is air conditioning units, you can go to the next slide, are all gulping for power at the same time. And as temperatures rise, the demand for electricity spikes and wires begin to overload. And under extreme conditions, we hear about these circuits failing. So you can think about air conditioning as rush hour traffic for the grid. And what happens is on the third day of a heat wave, when air conditioning you should source um, buildings and they struggle to keep us cool, uh, that rush hour traffic becomes gridlock. And so we start to get these uh, power outages and you read about them recently in New York and unfortunately they're happening in our friends in California and around the world. So what we do is we solve that problem for both building owners and electric utilities. Right. So uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about our company, Blue Frontier. So. Uh, you know, we create this environment where we can all relax in our air conditioned comfort, but consume the power for our air conditioning when we choose, when it's the lowest cost, perhaps, or more importantly, when it's cleanest for the environment. And we aggregate all these air conditioners on commercial buildings using artificial intelligence and a cloud-based service so they can automatically respond to price, clean energy, or even electric reliability signals. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so our technology really is truly revolutionary. And, um, you know, Air Carrier invented this technology more than 100 years ago, and it really hasn't changed. So this is the first time that uh, air conditioning for commercial buildings and eventually for residential users is being um, redefined. So for the environment, we deliver an 85% reduction in CO2 emissions. Um, you may know that air conditioners use this thing called a refrigerant, which has a very high global warming potential it's like 2000 times more potent than CO2 itself. So by wow. eliminating that gas in our design, you know, we do a great thing for the planet right there. And then for renewable energy, because you know, the sun is setting from noon to six, 
um, mm -hmm. as the demand for air conditioning is increasing in the afternoon. So you need energy storage to be able to shift that renewable energy to the more useful period of time during the afternoon. So we embed really low cost and high performance energy storage as a part of our air conditioning unit itself. And you know, for the grid, we dispatch that stored energy permanently and we eliminate this temperature weather driven demand that's continually locked together with utilities. You know, the hotter it gets, the more power you need on your island. So we break that uh, continuum. And finally, for the user, we deliver this huge breakthrough in energy savings. So we're, we're reducing the amount of energy used by 80%. And that wow. really translates into an 80% bill savings in most cases. So it's a dramatic uh, shift in performance and cost savings. Now you're going to tell us how you do that, right? <laughs> yeah. So we've been collaborating with the National Renewable Energy Lab for the last you know, five years or so, and we're commercializing their 12 patents. And we've uh, negotiated an exclusive license for that patent. And those patents cover this revolutionary method for cooling buildings. It's a low cost design that uses unique membrane based heat exchangers that provide independent control of humidity and right. uh, using a liquid desiccant and temperature using a novel indirect evaporative cooler. Um, Blue Frontier introduced the idea of using this liquid desiccant as a means for low cost uh, storage of clean energy. And uh, we received a grant from the US Department of Energy and we actually built some prototypes and we tested them at the Oak Ridge National Laboratories and we validated the cooling and energy savings performance against all the climate zones. So this works in climate zones like Hawaii from you know, kind of moderate temperature, but higher humidity to um, tropical environments to high desert environments. So it's really designed to be used across the globe. So what about in colder environments, like in Canada, for example, like during the winter? Well, you know, <laughs> you know it, it will it will cool buildings in Canada on hot days. And I think that's the issue you have in areas like Toronto, that they have to yeah. build the grid out for these three or four heat waves a year. And it's very costly to the utilities who has all this excess capacity. In fact, in New York, I think it's 11 percent of all the assets that Con Edison has on their on their distribution system are used about uh, seven days every other year. So wow. that's a lot of pent up capacity sitting around waiting for, um, you know, a heat wave. Right. So um, you go to the next slide. So what, what we really do here, this is, uh, you can go to the next one, go ahead, um, is this is a rendering of our air conditioning unit on the right. And it's a, it's a like for like replacement for what's called a package rooftop air conditioner, which you see on a lot of uh, commercial buildings. And on the left is our energy storage modules. And what's unique is we decouple the consumption of electricity from the supply of cooling. So we can store that renewable energy at night and during the day. And then in the afternoon, you know, when the grid is peaking, we can deliver cooling to the building using just about 100 watts of power, which is, you know, compared to maybe 7,000 watts of power. Mm -hmm. And the way we store and we shift energy is a platform for valuable energy management services. You know, the, the, the grid operators these days are trying to do distributed energy resources and, you know, use these as flexible resources to uh, manage the grid. And, and we're part of that solution set. Next slide, please. So this initial product is a is a like for like replacement for what's called the five ton package rooftop air conditioner, and it's truly ubiquitous. This is why it's useful to the utility because it's going to be found on all their distribution circuits. So, ninety seven percent of all commercial buildings under four stories are going to have a unit like this. And we talk about lower cost of ownership. You know, this eighty percent reduction in price. So on average, it's going to be higher in Hawaii. This is based on sixteen cents. You're going to spend forty-eight thousand dollars of your money, you know, buying air con energy for that air conditioner. But when you put in a Blue Frontier unit, you know, we're going to we're going to drop that uh, by eighty, a full eighty percent. So you know, maybe eight thousand dollars over the useful life. And right. we expect to have lower maintenance costs and lower operating costs. And it'll be installed by the same air conditioning trades that we have uh, in the market today. Right. So if you go to the next slide. I tell you, there's more than just breakthrough energy efficiency. This behind the meter energy storage uh, will last for up to seven hours and it avoids seven kilowatts of demand and 50 kilowatt hours of energy. You can think of that maybe as the equivalent of three Tesla uh, power walls, except it has a 90% lower installed costs. And um, 
because we don't have an inverter, so we're using this stored energy to provide cooling to the building. So it's just right. specific for cooling. We don't need an inverter and we don't need electricians and we don't need to talk to the utility about how to interconnect it. And of course, fires and toxicity are not a concern. So all these things that we love about batteries, but you know, make them a little bit difficult, we solve that problem by embedding it right into our technology itself. Um, so uh, so quick if you question, think about- Quick question. Sure. So uh, what about the fluid that you use for your uh, energy storage? Is that uh, environmentally benign or is it uh, a hazardous material or what's the story with that? That's a great question. So it's, it's called a liquid desiccant and it's, it's a salt. So it's actually food grade, it's non-toxic. And you can use potassium acetate or you can use lithium chloride. And it's a very low cost, long lived medium. Um, it's corrosive and that's one of the secrets of our technology is how do we manage that corrosive salt uh, to make a long uh, useful life product. But uh, that's, that's a great question, thanks. Yeah. So when we talk about you know, two high growth markets that our business is addressing is this behind the meter storage and this hyper efficiency for buildings, really zero net energy buildings. So if in summary, kind of what we bring is a high benefit to cost ratio, really breakthrough energy efficiency. We eliminate this summer peak demand problem. We store and we shift clean energy, we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, operating expenses, and enabling the zero net energy, you know, building kind of model. So, so it's, um, uh, quick it's something. Question. Another quick question. So uh, you've probably heard about the duck curve. So how would this help yeah. us out with our duck curve problems? That's the best question I've heard in a long time. So the duck curve is the increase of air conditioning between noon and six right. and the decrease in solar energy between noon and six. Uh, noon and six. So as that solar energy is going down, um, the demand for air conditioning is going up. And that's because the sun is heating up our buildings and our air conditioners are starting to be engaged. So what we do is we completely eliminate that duck curve because in that afternoon when the air conditioning, um, which by the way, the, the demand for air conditioning in terms of power of kilowatts uh, per ton increases as temperature increases, okay. right? So as the hotter it gets, the more power it consumes. So in our case, we've stored that energy and instead of 7,000 watts going maybe up to 8,000 watts, we're using a constant 100 watts. So wow. we completely eliminate that summer afternoon demand and shift the solar energy. So it's it's the perfect fit um, yeah. for the duck curve. Good, Great. huge. It's a big it's a big problem here in Hawaii. Yes, it, it is, and, and you know we're happy to be a part of uh, you know bringing these solutions to market. It's not easy commercializing you know, high technology solutions that are asset based, but this is something that our team has done before and we bring a great team. If you want to show that slide of our team, you can do that. Uh, Daniel, Dr. Daniel Betts, um, you know, who's the, who's the CEO of the company and my, uh, you know, uh, and myself, I've been in this clean energy business for, you know, since 2000 or so. And Matt Tillman's, who is our CTO is a Princeton undergrad and he's got two Stanford degrees and, Matt Tillman is great at uh, getting products manufactured into the market. So, you know, we, we thank you for the opportunity to, to share this clean energy business with you and, and with your listeners. And, you know, we hope to bring it to Hawaii soon. Okay. Well, that's kind of okay. the end of the slideshow, right? Correct? Yep. Okay. So we have another 15 minutes to go. So this is a great time to stop for our one little 30 minute, uh, 30 second or one minute break. And then we'll be back. So stand by, we'll All be right. back in one minute. Thanks okay. to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Munley and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all.
We're back from our break. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, and we're delighted to be able to bring you uh, Greg uh, Trapsa from um, Blue Planet Frontier, or Blue here. Frontier AC. And he's here uh, telling us all about the magic of their new technology. It just sounds really awesome. And now we have a chance to do some uh, Q&A. So I'm going to start okay. off with a Q. And uh, so my <laughs> Q is, uh, so there's two flavors of utilities. There's the electric utility, and then there's the gas utility. So I kind of understand where the electric utility would play a role in this. But could you elucidate a little bit more um, how a gas utility could be involved in this type of uh, technology? Well, yeah, that, that's, that's a great question because the, uh, the method of air conditioning with desiccant regeneration is actually a heat driven process itself. So uh, the way we, we cool buildings using um, the liquid desiccant is we pump it into our heat exchanger and it absorbs moisture out of the air. Well, now I've got moisture in our lithium chloride solution. I've got to re reject that moisture out so I can reuse the fluid. And you do that with a low temperature heat, like 80 degrees C kind of heat. Mm -hmm. And in, in one instance, we have a heat pump that's electric driven that um, is used to regenerate that heat. But in another instance, we uh, use a fuel cell and we use, so the user gets the power from the fuel cell and we take the waste heat from the fuel cell and we use that to regenerate the liquid desiccant. And this could work. So it's like a micro combined cycle heating and cooling unit where instead of using the heat for hot water uh, and having to do the integration of the hot water um, through the fuel cell, we actually bring our own, own load with us. So we put this whole kit up on the roof and it can work with inter internal combustion engines or simple burner systems. So it can be used to shift um, some of that electrical demand to the gas grid. And that's very efficient because the site to source transmission of gas is very efficient. So when I transmit a unit of gas, you know, 98, 99% of that is useful at the site. When I generate electricity and transmit it to the site, I might use lose 66% of the energy in the process. So uh, use of clean uh, natural gas um, is actually a, a green, greenhouse gas saving solution for many environments. So um, I'm, I'm a fuel cell guy and a hydrogen guy. So this was music to my okay. ears when I heard fuel cell. One of the issues we have in the fuel cell world with uh, PEM fuel cells, proton exchange membranes, like a solid state fuel cell, is that they really produce a low level or low grade of heat. You know, it's like just slightly below the uh, boiling point of water. And so it's not really useful, but it sounds like your process could actually use this lower temperature heat and therefore increase the, the overall energy extraction, uh, you know, like, producing both electricity and heat from the fuel cell to quite a high number. Would you uh, care to comment on that? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. So this is low temperature heat. So we're talking about 80 degrees C. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it is useful. And in fact, interesting enough, when some of our models, you know, because we're, we're using that waste heat, you drive high efficiencies, you know, above 95%, let's say. And um, so even as the fuel cell begins to degrade over time, we capture that degradation in terms of useful heat. And we have we we convert that heat to a kilowatt offset electric mm -hmm. offset. So if you have, let's say, a one and a half kilowatt fuel cell, you know we add another seven and a half kilowatts effectively of uh, electrical displacement uh, by by the, using this form of air conditioning. So it's it's, it's a very cost effective solution. So uh, can you tell us where you are in your technology development cycle? Um, you know what's the status now of the company and. And are you doing any trials? I mean, what, what's, uh, you know, what's the testing program here? Yeah, so Blue Frontier has uh, uh, built prototypes that have been fully tested. So, we, you know, you start with the lab phase where you build models. And then the next stage is you actually build full-scale prototypes and you test them independent labs. And we've done that with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And recently, Blue Frontier has been the recipient of a very large grant from the New York State Research and Energy and Development Authority commonly known as NYSERDA. Right. And what we're doing with NYSERDA in collaboration again with the national labs is we're creating the design for manufacturability. And so within about 18 months, we will have pilot production units that will then be installed on commercial buildings and then tested. But about two years from now, we should have product available 
for uh, commercial sale. Okay. So um, do you have a bulk, I mean, you talked about numbers, so what's kind of, uh, let's just go over the, uh, the economics again uh, to reinforce uh, the value proposition here. So yeah, absolutely. So what, at, the, at the end of the day, what we like about this product is just toe to toe against the ubiquitous, you know, in situ air conditioning industry, we're a lower manufactured cost. Right. Now we have a disadvantage because they're making 400 units per minute. Wow. And quite honestly, if we made 4,000 units, we'd be a very happy business, <laughs> let alone uh, making yeah. them per minute. So how do you compete? But by eliminating the, uh, all of the copper, so we have no copper, we don't have any electrical compressor motor, we don't have expansion valves, we don't have evaporator coils. Uh, you know, it's a simple, beautiful thermodynamic cycle. So it's actually lower cost to manufacture. Now out of the gate, how do we cross the chasm with, you know, low, um, low volume manufacturing, but even at low volume, we hope to be able to price our unit competitively on a first cost basis to a high efficiency package rooftop unit. So you might expect to pay $7,500 for a high efficiency package rooftop unit. So let's talk now, about early oh, sorry, on. Go ahead. Ahead. Sorry. Yeah, to bring more revenue into the company, because we also include energy storage, we contract with the electric utility to provide the energy storage services on a competitive solicitation process against batteries or other demand response assets. Right. So that's called a non-wires alternative. Uh, where the utility could invest in upgrading a wire uh, in many environments now in California, specifically in New York, utilities are free to buy behind the meter resources under contract. So we'll get paid for the energy storage module too. And so we'll have nice, healthy profit margins at inception. Could you talk a little bit about operating this in a corrosive salt air environment? So for example, I have heat exchangers on my chiller units out at the Marine Corps base. I got to tell you, within two years, the uh, radiator, which was aluminum thin, uh, turned to dust and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and everything else just all fell apart. So I think you guys have some kind of a technology that is, you know, will, will help on that side. Can you talk a little bit about that. Well, we do. Yeah, we do, because those rusting parts are called the evaporator coil and the condensing coil. Those right. are the two elements of heat rejection and we don't have either of those. So right. we completely eliminate the, <laughs> all of those parts that corrode and rust over time. And uh, it's, it's just another fabulous part of the design of the device itself. So what kind of a maintenance uh, routine is required then given that you don't have any of these corrosive parts? I mean, so obviously there's gonna be a lot of savings and potential savings in your maintenance cost uh, and in addition to your operation cost. Do you have any kind of a, a feel for that? So here, here's what we what we suspect. So your filter changes are going to be the same. So if you change filters semi-annually or periodically, you know, you're still going to have your same HVAC service company servicing our unit, by the way. We're going to be working with local mechanical trades. And so the idea here is this is a great job creation opportunity for skilled trades. Um, but the common uh, failure modes of an air conditioning system are uh, coil freeze up. So as the filters clog, um, the evaporator coil freezes up, and that's the most common failure mode, and we don't have that failure mode. The second one is refrigerant charge, and since we're not using refrigerant, we don't we avoid that one. So uh, then you get to condenser coil cleaning and maintenance, as you described. So the things that corrode that are on the outside, they also foul with dirt and dust and leaves and things like that. So the major maintenance items uh, are eliminated by our design, but you will have a periodic maintenance visit and an annual maintenance visit. Uh, very similar to what you have now with your standard air conditioning contract. Uh, so one of the other uh, issues I'm faced with with my hydrogen stations is like I have a uh, monster compressor and then my electrolyzer and they all reject or passed off a lot of heat. So they have to be chilled. So can your system be applied to those kinds of applications? I know we're talking about air conditioning, but what about chilling water and things like that for these kinds of heavy equipment where we're rejecting a lot of heat. Yeah, that's not a good fit for our application okay. because you know the, the main energy use inside buildings for comfort cooling is latent. So taking the humidity out of the air and in this environment, what you're describing is a sensible uh, heat. So we, we, you know, we, we do address sensible heat also, but um, probably not the best fit application. 
Uh, it can be used in data centers though. So that's, oh, that's okay. an area of- Yeah, very good. Uh, yeah, they use a lot of, uh, a lot of electricity to keep, the, keep those uh, computers cool. So yeah. Yeah. Good, good yeah. So this is not an intercooler, interstage cooler kind of technology. It's more of a for direct things that are in direct contact with the air for cooling. Okay. Well, we're closing in on about the last three minutes. So is there anything we missed that uh, you would like to uh, talk about uh, and fill in any of the holes here? Or well, you know. <laughs> The, the, the idea of this global decarbonization of the grid, it can actually be a great opportunity for local job creation and, and, and really reducing the carbon footprint and, and avoiding these gigatons of uh, carbon from the grid. So, you know, we at Blue Frontier are very passionate about our, uh, our, our statement for the environment and doing something good while doing something well. Um, so, you know, that's what we hope to do is we hope to, to contribute to solving this problem as emerging uh, markets, you know, around the globe, you know, I think several billion people are in the hottest areas of the world. Don't have air conditioning today, and will have air conditioning, or will require it as a as a feature a function of living in these hot environments. So we want to be a part of the solution for the planet. Oh, one last question came to mind when you were talking about uh, decarbonization. What about carbon credits? Is it possible? Are you looking at how you can? Um, evaluate how much uh, CO2 you're saving and then sell that as a carbon credit. It sounds like you could yeah. get a lot of carbon yeah, credits so if you're allowed to do it. And, and, yeah, so where there's green tags and white tag markets, we can easily quantify the carbon savings because of the energy savings and then also because of the greenhouse gas, the refrigerant itself. So a lot of jurisdictions, in fact, the Kigali treatment Treaty which is an amendment to the, I think it's the, the Kyoto Protocol or the Montreal Protocol, uh, the world seeks to eliminate this refrigerant. So uh, it definitely has a, a strong um, element that can be materially counted or tangibly counted to a savings and then sold. If, and then if that's, you can if the sell it and then offset the cost of your acquisition and your ongoing maintenance costs of the system, right? Yep, yep, absolutely. Well, uh, we're down to our last 30 seconds. So one, any last final thought? Going, going, gone almost, Greg. <laughs> well, the last final thought is thank you and aloha. And I, I, I wish I was in Hawaii enjoying the weather with you today. I'm sitting here lamenting in my minus one degrees. Uh, best, best to you and to your show and to your right. viewers. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Okay, thanks so much, Greg. We really appreciate it. And to all our viewers out there, that's our show for the day. I hope you found that as interesting as I did. It's fascinating technology. He, uh, there is a cure for uh, carbon, and uh, th this is one of the solutions we have. So I uh, will be. I won't be back. I won't be here next week. I'm attending a fuel cell seminar in uh, Long Beach, California. We're going to get the latest and greatest uh, hot skinny on the, the new technologies coming out. And so the following week, I'll see you. And so it's Aloha from Hawaii, the state of clean energy.